Welcome everyone. This is Russ Carnahan, President of Preservation Action. Uh, this is our uh, first ever uh, Congressional Town Hall uh, that's also virtual. Uh, we've planned this in place of our Congressional Reception that we've done normally each year during the Advocacy Week. And we are super pleased uh, that we have some great members of Congress joining us today uh, from across the country. Uh, we're gonna have uh, Congressman Earl Blumenauer who co-chairs the Historic Preservation Caucus, uh, Representative Darren LaHood, who has been a lead co-sponsor of the 2019 Historic Tax Credit Growth and Opportunity Act, and Representative Shelley Pingree uh, from Maine, who is the chair of the House Interior Appropriations Subcommittee uh, that is very important for preservation funding. And uh, before we get started with our uh, members, uh, I wanna introduce uh, Lauren McHale, who's chair of the Preservation Action Foundation uh, to introduce a very special group that have been participating in Advocacy Week this year, our Preservation Action Advocacy Scholars. Uh, Lauren. Thanks, Russ. Um, each year during Advocacy Week, the Preservation Action Foundation offers an opportunity for individuals interested in preservation advocacy to meet with all of you, advocates from around the country, participate in trainings, policy discussions, and to join a state de delegation during congressional office visits. So tonight, I'm very honored to introduce our 2021 Advocacy Scholars, Kristen Thomas, Hannah Stark, Laura Solman, May Bully, Ksenia Bradner, Robert Edwards, and Sydney Landers. And I just wanna say congratulations to all of you and thank you so much for joining us this week. We're thrilled to have you here. And I also wanna say thanks from the foundation for um, all of those uh, who served on their Advocacy Scholars Committee and our generous sponsors, our mentors and the state coordinators that made this another very successful year for our Advocacy Scholars Program. So thanks again and um, Thank you for thank you all for being here tonight. Thank you, Lauren. And thank you to the advocacy scholars uh, for being part of this uh, uh, historic preservation advocacy week. I uh, want to turn to our, our first uh, congressional guest uh, this evening. Uh, no stranger to anyone in Washington, certainly no stranger to people in Portland, Oregon. Uh, but more importantly for the group here today from around the country, uh, no stranger to historic preservation. Uh, that's Congressman Earl Blumenauer. Uh, he has been a passionate uh, public servant, uh, innovative problem solver from the time he's been on the city council through his years in Congress. He's on the Influential House Ways and Means Committee. Um, and uh, I'm so pleased, I could not have, uh, could not have thought of a better person to see me when I left Congress to co-chair the Historic Preservation Caucus. Uh, proud to call you a friend and colleague, and uh, thank you for your leadership in historic preservation. Uh, let me uh, turn it over to Congressman Earl Blumenauer. Thank you, Russ. Uh, I uh, appreciate the kind words as I've uh, appreciated our partnership, uh, first as colleagues and more recently, dealing with historic preservation. Um, you know, when I first was elected to Congress, uh, I was introduced to the opportunities of historic preservation in St. Louis by my former colleague and your friend, Dick Gephardt. Yes. And being able to appreciate the opportunities in your community. Um, and it, uh, it's been a great opportunity ever since. Um, let me just uh, touch on a few things. Uh, we can come back and uh, deal with the conversation. Uh, first and foremost, we are focused on expanding the historic tax credit. We're going to introduce the legislation to, uh, to modernize and expand the tax credit. It will be identical to legislation that passed the House with HR2 um, that uh, unfortunately died in the Senate. We think this year, uh, it's a different situation uh, because we're not going to have uh, a U.S. Senate that's going to sit on legislation from the House. 
they're going to be an active partner. Uh, I just had uh, two sessions today with Majority Leader Chuck Schumer. Um, it's, uh, it is really uh, the difference between night and day. Uh, we just passed a massive uh, $1.9 trillion relief package. Uh, we're dealing with historic legislation, dealing with gun safety. Uh, you can sense the energy. Uh, there's a different type of partnership with the Senate. And I think it's going to carry forward with our work with, the with modernizing the tax credit. And you have done a terrific job laying the foundation with some of my friends in the Senate. Uh, the second item that we're working on uh, is the letter that uh, you're going to be hearing in a moment from Shelley Pingree. And we're circulating a, a letter right now requesting her uh, and ranking member Joyce. Uh, Dave Joyce is a terrific friend and a terrific legislator uh, seeking full funding for the Historic Preservation Fund, the full $150 million, uh, which to my knowledge has never happened before. But we think we have an opportunity now uh, for a whole host of reasons, uh, given that uh, there's probably no more effective, but kind of a hidden uh, opportunity in terms of economic development, uh, that all the reasons that you care about uh, historic preservation and the project of uh, the process, uh, we're very excited about that. Uh, over the course of, uh, since 1976, uh, we've watched how the tax credit has incentivized private sector investment in areas that uh, desperately need it and in a way that has had a tremendous impact. Um, I think that we need to do a better job of beating the drum about the total impact of the historic tax credit and what it has done in every state and virtually every community across the country. More than $130 billion of private capital. Uh, it's created, what, two and a half million jobs. Um, it's uh, the 44,000 buildings that have been rehabilitated, you know, I'd, I'd love to have a great big green dot on every single project that has taken advantage of this. I think people would be shocked to find out how much impact it has had on our communities across the country. Now, my Republican friends passed a, a rather bizarre tax bill, uh, uh, $1.7 trillion giving uh, tax benefits to people who basically didn't need it uh, and messed with a number of other things. But at least they kept uh, the historic tax credit. But as you know, they reduced the value of the credit. And we're going to seek to do something about that. Uh, our legislation builds off the success of the historic tax credit by making improvements to the value and attractiveness of the credit for smaller rehabilitation projects. Uh, there are long overdue changes to the, to the historic tax credit that'll make it more accessible, more affordable, and more efficient of projects of all sizes. Now, as you know, um, we've had huge problems with the COVID-19 pandemic and the downturn in the ability to finance. There isn't the appetite for the credit. So we're providing a temporary increase in the credits value for all project sizes as a response to COVID-19. We think it's entirely consistent with what we are doing um, and look forward to support for that. We wanna make it easier to finance small historic re re rehabilitation projects. Um, we're increasing the credit to 30% and providing for transferable certificates. We want to make sure that more buildings are eligible for the credit by reducing the requirement to pass the substantial rehabilitation test. We eliminate the tax credit basis reduction that has decreased the value of the credit. And last but not least, and something that's near and dear to my heart, is to improve the ability of tax exempt projects like community health centers, libraries, uh, art centers, schools, universities, to qualify. You know, many uh, of the most amazing opportunities for historic preservation and rehabilitation 
are found in these tax exempt projects. And we want to make sure that they can take advantage of this uh, really important tool. Uh, we are committed to working with you to be able to make the case, uh, make the case that these projects are unique. They revitalize our communities. They spur economic development. Uh, they promote tourism and local industry. They are very job intense. Um, and they return more money to the treasury than the cost of the credit. Our estimate is about $1.20 in tax revenue for every dollar that is invested. These projects rely on local skilled labor. As I say, they're very labor intense. Uh, they are more sustainable than new construction. Recycling buildings is more environmentally benevolent. And they're, they're just at the heart of what makes a livable community. By enhancing the existing credit, the Historic Tax Credit Growth and Opportunity Act will allow for more stories to be told in more communities, large and small, across America. I deeply appreciate the, the partnership that we've had over the years. I will tell you that historic preservation and the tax credit has made a big difference in my community. Uh, and I look forward to telling those stories with you across the country. Thanks for letting me be with you this afternoon for the sort of the virtual uh, meeting that we're having. Uh, I'll be happy to hear any comments or try and answer questions. I have my colleague, John Bosworth, who's done yeoman work on this, as you know, um, and uh, he can deal with the, the questions that I can't answer. So Russ, thank you, uh, Allison. Uh, I'm all yours. Thank you so Thank much. Thank you very much for those powerful words. That that was really great. And we've been making the argument or the, I don't know if the argument, but the the point that for especially for our rural main streets at, to be a destination experience and to stay alive, the tax credit is crucial. It is crucial not only to urban neighborhoods, but crucial for rural America to maintain our rural downtowns. So thank you, Congressman. I really, really appreciated your strong that's, words. That's a very powerful point, Allison. And in fact, as we have Shelley coming on, I think in a few minutes, uh, I've seen the impact in her state, uh, what historic preservation has done in taking some of the most picturesque parts of New England in the state of Maine. Uh, she's seen it in spades. Um, and that's a, that is a, an opportunity for us to build the coalition, strengthen our ask, and then next year come back for even more. I'm going to ask if we have uh, our uh, Preservation Action Foundation uh, advocacy scholar on Robert Edwards for a question. I see, I see uh, Robert. Uh, welcome. Robert is... Uh, um, is a cultural and architectural historian and uh, with the landscape architecture firm in Charlottesville, Virginia. Uh, Robert, you have a question for the Congressman. I do, good evening, Congressman. Um, there, there's been a huge shift in public awareness about the goal for federal support of equity, diversity and inclusion. Can you reflect on how historic preservation is well positioned to be a part of furthering this goal? That's, that is a very important observation and it's part of what we need to do. Uh, th this is an opportunity for us to rediscover our roots in an unvarnished fashion. Um, the diversity of our experience across the country, uh, the more that we can concentrate on historic preservation to be able to recapture and rekindle what has happened in the past, uh, not be fighting over stupid things like you've seen in, in the state of Virginia about uh, monuments and uh, just non-productive discussion, but go back and look at what's happened in Virginia over the course of the last 400 years. And true historic preservation, being able to recognize the many contributions of the people who designed, the people who built it, uh, the people who've occupied, um, I think is 
an important way to tell our story. One of the things that drives me crazy is that people get all kind of twisted up and they start arguing about things that uh, really are irrelevant. But dealing with true historic preservation, the story of how these projects came about, who did it, who built it, what is the legacy, I think is a way in a non-threatening way to be able to strip away some of the extraneous items and be able to appreciate the true historic context. Uh, I, I appreciate your question. I, I love what's happened in Charlottesville. Uh, there's uh, some mixed history there. Uh, and again, uh, dating back to uh, Thomas Jefferson and his uh, sort of tortured individual legacy uh, helps us look at the big picture. And that's a way I think to bring us together um, in a way that's much more productive. Uh, I appreciate your observation. I think it's very important. Thank you. Thank you, Robert. And um, I wanted to ask, uh, as other questions may be coming in here, uh, a question for the Congressman. You know, we've, uh, many of us have talked about the kind of inherent value of historic preservation uh, for our history and our culture and for education. Um, and you touched on it certainly, but uh, we've really made a point to be part of the bigger conversations about economic relief, uh, how it needs to be part of that big puzzle, uh, how it can be part of sustainability, uh, which you mentioned. Um, can you talk to uh, our advocates here about uh, how to connect preservation with some of these biggest issues of the day on top of its inherent value? Well, that's, that is a big assignment, Russ. Uh, but I think that in a sense, that is an obligation for all of us uh, because historic preservation is not something to be build, viewed in isolation. It's not about a pretty building. It's not about uh, fixing up dilapidated property. Um, it really is the context of the big picture and it touches on all of the major issues of the day. I mentioned that recycling buildings is a much greener approach in terms of sustainability, reducing carbon. Uh, it is an economic development, both in terms of what we do with these projects, investing money that are very labor, labor intensive, but also in terms of revitalization of community and what happens uh, in terms of tourism. Uh, true historic preservation strips away some of the veneer about how we got there. It deals with some of the troubling uh, history of racial discrimination, of oppression, of enslaved people um, in a way that uh, there's just no denying uh, what that history is and being able to do it in the context of what happened and what we have and being welcoming of uh, people being able to tell the full story. I mean, these are the issues of our time, racial justice, uh, economic opportunity, uh, and understanding our past. And historic preservation touches all of those items and more. Uh, well, well said. And uh, we have a question from uh, the audience and I know this would come up um, be, uh, largely due to your leadership and success in advocacy efforts to year after year have been doing gradual increases uh, to get up to uh, the ability to request full funding this year. Uh, where do, what do you see in terms of strategy in addressing raising the cap at some point um, when, when we hit that? Yeah. Well, I think first of all, we need to put on a full court press to get full funding this year. Yes. The next is to be able to deal with the modernization of the tax credit. Uh, this is, I think, absolutely essential. And finally, I think we all ought to work. You know, I, I joked, and I've done this in the past with some of the conferences, uh, and I'm not joking. You know, I, I want to do a better job of identifying the 44,000 projects across the country that have benefited from the historic tax credit. Uh, the better job we do identifying what difference it has made for things that touch our hearts, 
that stir our imagination and give us a sense of who we are. We've never seen, I think, anything to match what we have uh, experienced, not just in the Capitol over the last six weeks, but what, well, Charlottesville. I mean, we, we, we faced uh, with Robert problems in Charlottesville with some of the racial flashpoints. Um, this is a challenging time. I see historic preservation, which has some bipartisan support in Congress. And if we all do our job, it will have even more bipartisan support. So this is common language about who we are, where we've been, and most important, where we're going. And I think that's, that's the formula. That's the formula. And well, working together, we can build on that. We can expand it. We can have more tools. And moving forward, we're going to be in a stronger position to be able to take uh, larger steps in the next Congress or two. But we need to be successful in this Congress. And with your help, I think we can. So, thank you so much. Allison, we, have you, a, you have, oh, we have a question from Jeremy Wells that I would like to get out if I could. Yes. Um, and the question from Jeremy Wells is, how might the preservation tax credit be modified to better address the supply of affordable housing? Well, I am not, uh, I'm not uh, certain that we can't use the existing mechanism. Uh, I would welcome uh, working with a number of your members with the projects they've had. Uh, they're not always the, the easiest for affordable housing because as we know, the tax credit um, is, uh, is a challenge. Uh, this, if we're going to have uh, uh, housing that is fully compliant uh, with the standards for affordable housing, uh, that's, that's a pretty high bar. And we're seeing in my community uh, affordable housing uh, can run $300,000, $400,000 a unit, depending on where it is and the, uh, and the circumstances. Uh, from my uh, vantage point, part of it is uh, being able to work with people in this space. You have people with some experience. I would welcome their thoughts about tweaks that they see that might make a difference. Uh, part of it, though, I think is going to be beyond the historic tax credit, but it speaks to the priority we need to attach to affordable housing generally. Affordable housing needs to be a higher priority in every community. There isn't a community in this country where somebody who's a minimum wage worker can afford a typical apartment. So we've got a challenge to make sure that the federal government is a better partner with housing. I spent uh, the summer before last looking at the role that the federal government plays in terms of housing. Uh, the summary I had of that report is it's time for the federal government to get back in the game. Part of it is providing more direct subsidy. Uh, things like Section 8 housing vouchers, I think, should be like an entitlement, just like food stamps. Uh, we ought to be able to make sure that anybody who's entitled uh, qualifies for them. We need to spend more money on public housing. And if we have the federal government spending more money on tools that we have, uh, like Section 8, uh, being a partner in building affordable housing, I think that might help. But I, I welcome thoughts with some of the certified smart people that are part of your network uh, for other suggestions, but I would uh, invite people to look at the report that I wrote, uh, and it is uh, on my website uh, that represents uh, a summer of hard work and reflection, and the fact that the federal government was involved with blatant discrimination, especially against Black Americans and other people of color, to cut them out of the opportunity for uh, home ownership generally. Yeah, thank. That's a great, great point, and and great questions for the congressman. Uh, we have your uh, colleague, uh, Representative LaHood. Oh, uh, well, I'll shut up. 
be uh, He's a next, pro. At, next at bat. Uh, but okay. uh, just Hi, Earl. thank Hi, you. I'm, I'm sorry that I prattled on. If I if they no, 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 no. your your timing was impeccable. Get out of the way. Let me just say everybody word. knows everybody knows Congress runs on time. Yeah, well, let me just say a word <laughs> about Representative LaHood. Uh, one of the highlights of my public service career, other than serving with you, Russ, was working with uh, his father, Ray LaHood, <laughs> a dear friend, a dedicated public servant. And I will tell you that this Congressman LaHood is picking up where his father left off uh, and has already established himself as a distinguished and productive member of our Ways and Means Committee. Uh, and I look forward to working with him on these items. Good to see you. Thank I'll you get so out much, of your way. Earl, Thank and, you, Earl. And, um, I'm going to uh, welcome uh, Congressman LaHood. It's great to have you. We have, uh, uh, of course, an Illinois uh, introduction for you following uh, Earl's in, uh, pre-introduction uh, <laughs> with Frank Butterfield from Landmarks, uh, Illinois. Frank, uh, would you do the honors of introducing the congressman. Of course, hi, Congressman LaHood. Good to see you, Frank. Uh, good to see you. Uh, in my time at Landmarks, Illinois, you know, I've had the pleasure to work with Congressman LaHood on a number of projects and initiatives in Illinois, including Route 66, just a couple blocks outside my Springfield, uh, touring historic tax credit projects, and his willingness to sit down with developers and community leaders to learn what he can do to make the historic places of our towns uh, special and, and preserve them for future generations. So I give a huge thank you to the Congressman and his fantastic staff who have worked to improve the historic tax credit and increase investment in our in our community. So thank you so much and, and welcome Congressman Darren LaHood. Well, thank you, Frank. Great to see you and great to be part of the uh, town hall on historic preservation uh, with, with all of you and uh, Congressman Carnahan, great to be with you as always uh, and, and um, Pleasure uh, to, to join you tonight and thanks for your advocacy. And Earl, thanks for the nice introduction. Uh, likewise, enjoy working with you um, on the Ways and Means Committee, on the Trade Subcommittee and uh, the work that we are doing together. So uh, great to be with you today. Um, and also, um, obviously in 19, uh, I'm sorry, 2019, I was proud to be uh, a champion of historic preservation um, and to receive that award. Uh, with you, Frank, and I think Rob Naylor was there too, and we had a wonderful event um, when, when we were meeting in person, but I still have that prominently displayed in my office here, uh, and it's a great reminder of the work um, that, that we have been engaged in and the work, of course, uh, that we have uh, ahead of us also. Um, as, as you know well, Frank, my district, Central uh, West Central Illinois, uh, we're proud of our historic heritage there and many of our medium-sized, smaller cities, and of course, the heritage of, of Lincoln and, and Reagan and um, uh, that, that is throughout our, our district there. Um, but obviously the need uh, for historic preservation in many of our neighborhoods there as it relates to our housing and obviously um, uh, business development throughout uh, Illinois and how important the legislation that uh, I, I'm a co-sponsor with, with Congressman Blumenauer and, and also our Senate colleagues too, um, Senator Cassidy and Senator Cardin and uh, look forward to continuing to push that and be an advocate and work as hard as we can uh, to get it across the finish line. It is a, a, it is a tool that we need to build upon uh, and a tool that can be used uh, to have uh, real tangible results, both from the economic standpoint, from the preservation standpoint, um, and from a, a tourist transport, uh, tra uh, standpoint also. Um, so I know we've made a few tweaks to the legislation since last time, uh, but again, uh, look forward to continuing to be engaged uh, in a bipartisan way on that. Um, I will also mention, and I think you referenced it too, Frank, uh, our, our role with designating Route 66 as a um, National Historic Trail. Uh, when I served prior to the Ways and Means Committee, I was on the Natural Resources Committee and we advocated there. We continue to do that uh, along with Congresswoman Napolitano uh, and, and the work that we're doing there, uh, again, um, in, a, in a bipartisan way uh, to, to help uh, promote uh, and take Route 66 to the next level. I will also mention that um, we have been very involved in the western part of my district uh, with New Philadelphia uh, in the national park system. Uh, we have a bill, H.R. 820, uh, that is the New Philadelphia 
National Historic Park Act um, that we um, are working with Senator Durbin on. Uh, of course, Senator Obama and then President Obama was engaged on this issue. Uh, we think um, it is, uh, uh, I, I think it's situated well and, and uh, ready for uh, that designation, but uh, we're not there yet. And so we continue to work on that um, and preserving that history uh, in, in uh, West Central Illinois. So uh, again, uh, happy to be on. And let me also, uh, Russ and, and Frank, acknowledge all of the people on the call for the work that you do in historic preservation um, and, and for your advocacy back home uh, and being engaged on these issues. It's important for us as policymakers, as we uh, work here on those issues to know that you uh, are in the trenches and working hard and that uh, hearing your feedback uh, and a continued dialogue and discussion on these issues is important so that we can be as effective as possible in Washington, DC. So Russ, with that, happy to open up for questions or comments on anything that I mentioned there. Thanks so much. Uh, we, uh, while we are teeing up, we have a advocacy scholar uh, that we're gonna, uh, has a question for you. Uh, we have a group of advocacy scholars that have our students and young professionals. And while that's being teed up, I wanna, uh, just as a point of personal privilege, because Route 66 goes through my hometown in St. Louis and Rolla uh, on Southwest. Um, uh, tell us a little bit about the bill and, and, and you know, how you think that's gonna have an impact as we uh, celebrate that and, and really develop that that history. Sure. Um, well, as as many people are aware, Route 66, you know, goes from Chicago all the way to, to California and is really um, historic and and uh, iconic in terms of the roadway. But it, it's it's turned into a, a real tourist attraction with uh, from an international standpoint. A lot of people will fly into Chicago. They'll uh, rent a motor home, they'll rent motorcycles, they'll rent a car, and they'll travel Route 66. Um, and, and that, of course, winds through much of my district, through Missouri, and then across eight states um, before uh, it ends up in California. And, and what, we, what we're hoping to do, Russ, with the National Historic Trail uh, is through uh, the, the, the Park Service and through um, um, uh, the um, through the Interior Department, sorry, uh, will will the designation will allow it to be marketed by the Park Service. It will uh, designate certain portions of that for uh, advertising and promotion uh, by the Park District, uh, which again uh, by the Park Service, which will again continue to highlight the importance of it. Uh, and we think um, it's got broad broad bipartisan support. The holdup, it's passed the House, uh, I think, twice now. Um, but the holdup has been Senator Inhofe in, in, the, in the Senate. We're making some progress on a few of his, um, uh, hurt, the few of the hurdles that, that he's, uh, and a few of the issues that he's had concerns about, but we're optimistic that we can get it across the finish line this time. Um, and again, I think about little communities uh, throughout my district, Atlanta, Illinois, Tawanda, and of course Springfield's a little larger, but the amount of people that come through these small towns uh, traveling on Route 66 that uh, get off and, and have a dinner or they stay the night or they learn about the history of those small communities and Route 66. And, and uh, this will be uh, accentuated and highlighted even more by the designation. So um, that's a little bit about it. And, and again, we're, we're again optimistic we can get it through the Senate this year. Well, that's exciting. Thank you for your work on that. And uh, we're looking forward to lots of traffic coming through Missouri on the way. <laughs> Um, we have uh, Maggie Salman. She is uh, an advocacy scholar, is a student at the University of Pennsylvania, uh, on the line with the question. Uh, Maggie. Hi, um, I would just like first to extend my thanks for your leadership on the Federal Historic Tax Credit Program. Um, yesterday, we did hear from Mara Hoopengartner, president of the National Trust uh, Community and Investment Corporation. Community Investment Corporation um, about key provisions to the HTC Growth and Opportunity Act. And I'm just curious of your own insights of how you believe um, preservationists can be the most helpful and encouraging support for these provisions. Yeah, Maggie, first of all, thank you uh, for your question. Very relevant and uh, appreciate uh, your advocacy. I mean, you know, um, as we look at how do we uh, get this across the finish line, how do we make these 
changes to public policy, which will be helpful. I think engagement as much as possible from preservationists and people across the country um, to, to, to obviously contact uh, their, their members of Congress, uh, the staff, uh, and let them know uh, how impactful uh, these provisions uh, to public policy will be uh, from an economic standpoint, from a preservation standpoint, um, uh, you know, from a professional standpoint, uh, uh, contingent upon what business you're in, all those things are going to be helpful. Um, we know that on the call here, uh, but um, many of my colleagues may not know that. And so uh, your engagement, your advocacy, your education of, of colleagues in the House and Senate and their staffs are going to be important on that um, because uh, th this will have, uh, you know, will make a real difference uh, and, and, and be effective. And so uh, that, that would be my advice, Maggie, is, is and, and listen, I don't pretend to be the expert on many of these issues, um, but I do know uh, how, you know, the policy and changing the law will be helpful uh, to the work that you're engaged in. But your expertise and knowledge uh, in, in, in talking to the other elected officials will, will be important. And again, the, the bipartisan nature of this, I think, um, should be one of the things that we highlight and talk to people about uh, and how it's both urban and rural, small communities, um, and how uh, it, it really transcends uh, the country. So those are a few of my thoughts, Maggie, as, as you look at how you guys can uh, be involved with the process. Thank you. And we have time for one more question. And I'm going to ask uh, Dr. Allison Brooks to tee this one up because uh, we had your colleague, uh, Dan Newhouse, on yesterday, and he had been the champion of a state barn heritage program in Washington state. And he opened up the conversation about doing something nationally with that and coming from a rural district. Uh, so I'm gonna ask Dr. Brooks to, to tee that question up for you. Yes, thank you, Russ, and thank you, Congressman. Um, I don't know if you've heard, but Washington state has a grant program for historic barns. We have 800 heritage barns listed and I like to always remind people that it's rare to see anyone voluntarily list anything with government. And here we have 800 farms listing their barns with us. And we put we gave out almost three million dollars in grants to restore the barns. And it's been an incredible program connecting historic preservation to rural America. And so uh, we talked to Congressman Newhouse, who helped set up the program in our state when he was a state rep. Uh, for bringing the program nationally. So I thought maybe I, we could have your thoughts on what it would take or the possibility of having a national program to help restore our nation's barns since they are iconic on our landscape. I'm sure Illinois has amazing barns. <laughs> well, uh, yes, uh, thanks, Dr. Brooks. Um, and, and Dan Newhouse is, is, a, is a friend uh, and a colleague and, and have worked closely with him on a number of issues. So um, that's that's an aspect I wasn't aware that Dan was involved with, but but it, it suits him well. Well, listen, uh, my district, uh, as, as Russ knows, is, is central, west central Illinois. It's the eighth largest ag district in the country in terms of corn and soybean production. Uh, my district borders Missouri and Iowa. And so, yes, we have uh, some amazing family farms uh, and uh, as you referenced, iconic uh, barns. Uh, what I try to do, I have 19 counties in my district, Dr. Brooks, and my, my wife and I have three teenage boys. And so we do a Christmas card every year. And we go to one, we, we try to jump around. So we've been to, we haven't been to all 19 yet to take a picture, but this last one, we were in Marshall County, Illinois, in front of a iconic crib barn from a 1913. And that's where our family Christmas card picture was taken. And it's got a big American flag on the side of it. And so it, we had so many compliments on that barn and uh, uh, on where it was taken and, and the history of that. And, and so uh, there, there and, and my district is dotted with many of those uh, similar barns with a ton of history related to them. It's funny, um, uh, when you talk to farmers throughout my district uh, and you're on their land and I, I like to go out either during harvest or planting season or both to be with my farmers and get up in a combine, but uh, always there's a story about the history of their farm and the generations uh, that, that came and, and the different pro uh, 
uh, you know, the different properties and structures that are on their farm. And there's always a story about, you know, a particular barn and what year uh, it was established and the history related to that. And so, um, you know, I'm just thinking out loud here more than anything else, Dr. Brooks, but I could see how that would harmonize very well uh, with my district. So um, I appreciate you mentioning it to me. I'm happy to follow up with uh, Representative Newhouse and uh, with you guys on how we can uh, maybe get it off the ground. Yeah, that'd be great. Uh, I'm saying he, yeah, he, thank uh, you. he really laid that out yesterday and we thought that was a great idea, uh, but wanted to share that with you. Thank you. Yeah, thank you so much for being with us. Uh, we, we have uh, Representative Pingree up next and uh, be well and uh, keep up the great work. Thanks for what you're doing. Yeah, thanks Russ, thanks Dr. Brooks. And uh, again, thanks to uh, Frank and Rob Naylor back in Illinois and look forward to continuing to be engaged and uh, work in a bipartisan way uh, to get, um, get it across the finish line this year. Be safe, be healthy everyone, yeah. thank you, yeah. take care. I see, I see Shelly. Hello, how are you doing? This is Russ hi. Cunningham. Yeah, hi Russ, we miss you. Nice to see you, it's been a great while. To, great to see you. We have a special main guest to introduce you. Very uh, exciting. Sarah Peskin, who's the board chair of the Francis Perkins Center uh, in Maine. Uh, Sarah, can you do the honors and introduce I'll, the conference? I'll certainly, I'll certainly try. Um, uh, hi, everyone. Um, I, I have to say in introducing our wonderful Congresswoman Shelley Pingree that we need to recognize Women's History Month. Um, of course, some of us think it ought to be um, at least six months of the year, right? Um, 50% of the population. Um, um, she's the first woman to represent the first district of Maine and has, so, uh, has done so since uh, 2009. She's from North Haven, one of the many offshore islands that um, we boast. She's a mother, a farmer, a small business owner. She served on the school board and is a local tax assessor, all those things that, that it takes to make uh, small towns work. Um, she's been a state senator and the CEO of Common cause, but um, she's been a champion, not just for the, the people of her district that make up actually half of Maine's population, but for the nation's natural and cultural resources. And she gets that our economy from the traditional industries like fishing and in Maine tourism depend on clean water, clean air, and access to beautiful places. She's an advocate for parks, rivers, historic main streets and farmsteads and the protected landscapes that make our region a good place to live and work. Um, she's been a strong supporter of the many mechanisms that allow these places to function through partnerships among local state and federal governments and the private sector. Um, we thank her particularly for the Paycheck Protection Program that's helped our small nonprofit meet payroll during the pandemic and we congratulate her as the new chair of the House Interior Appropriations Committee. And we sleep easier knowing that her voice will strengthen its support of the National Park Service, the National Arts and Humanities Endowments, and the many great cultural institutions that make us proud to be Americans. Good to see you. Well, thank you so much, Sarah. That's very kind. And um, we're so pleased with the work that's been done at the Francis Perkins Center. So thank you um, for the hard work you've put in there and, and the major advancements. And I'm thrilled to hear that you uh, were also able to take advantage of the PPP program to, to help keep that afloat. Um, we were very excited. Well, first, thank you for inviting me here today. I'm pleased to to join you and it's always good to see my old friend Russ who we miss in Congress so nice to see um, you here and um, I'm really pleased to have this opportunity to uh, be the incoming chair the new chair of the interior appropriations committee and um, to be able to support the many things that that you mentioned in your introduction while I've been a long time member uh, this is my first chance to take on the role of chair and to do so in what I think is an exciting new time as we think about how to um, support our economy as we hopefully transition out of the pandemic um, and hopefully um, 
after the passage of the bill today are able to uh, start to work on both the appropriations process, but also a future infrastructure bill. And I'm thinking about all that that encompasses. Um, I'll just say a couple of quick things because I know you might want to ask some questions. Um, as you've heard, I, I represent the first congressional district of Maine. And one of the wonderful things about representing a New England district is we are just so steeped in history. It is an important part of our culture, our um, economy. It's It feeds into our tourism economy. And as you heard, I, I live on an island off the coast of Maine and the islands were some of the earliest settlements. Um, the farm that I live on was uh, first settled in 1784. And my favorite thing about the farm is that the people who came from Massachusetts actually brought their home with them, a classic Cape Cod um, that they brought on a barge to the island because that was common in those days. And the home is still um, in our community, carefully preserved. Um, of course, even more exciting about this piece of property is it was a site of an archaeological dig and native peoples visited here three to 4,000 years ago, um, which has been carefully documented. We have an active historical society in our community and everybody cares and knows about the history. Um, and, and I've really learned over the years how important it is to understand our history, um, to understand where we're going and the preservation of uh, the buildings, the things that really remind us of the details of what um, were part of that history are so important. Um, it was exciting to be able to see the Save America's Treasures grant go to the Francis Perkins Center, um, which uh, Sarah has so ably uh, worked with and chairs the board now um, that, as many of you may know, recognizes Francis Perkins, who was the first um, cab first female cabinet member um, and also the labor secretary for FDR. So we're very proud to have her home in Maine and um, being that it is Women's History Month, it's also a great time to think about the women leaders who came before all of us and the ground that they broke and particularly Frances Perkins, who was um, th so thoughtful about our workforce and labor needs and, and really thinking about the challenges that women workers in particular faced. But I'm excited about um, the opportunities we have here and the support that has gone into historic preservation and, and the funding that's come through our committee. Um, it's always been bipartisan. I know Representative LaHood um, preceded me on here. And just a reminder of um, his involvement, Dan Newshouse's involvement, and the support it's generally found on the committee. It's managed to, even in difficult times, um, continue to be funded. And I think it's considered a very effective and um, bipartisan way to support uh, historic preservation in Congress. So I'm looking forward to continuing to support it. Um, I've seen the many ways, uh, not just through the Francis Perkin House, but the many ways that uh, a small grant going to a community can really help to revitalize it, to preserve um, something that's critical to the history, but also um, build on you know, the economy around it. So I'm a true believer and I'm glad to be with you here today and just happy to take any questions or hear any thoughts that you might wanna let me know. Thank you so much. Uh, and I wanna just be able for the first time say congratulations, Madam Chair. Thank, so, you. <laughs> Thank you. We, we had such a great uh, uh, time working with uh, the subcommittee and, and your uh, predecessor, uh, Betty McCollum. And uh, I know she's moved on to another subcommittee, but uh, Look forward to working with you and your leadership. One of the questions that we have from Tom Cassidy from the National Trust uh, is about the Save America's Treasures program. Uh, it, a grant from there, I, I, I understand, uh, was helpful with the, the Perkins Center. Uh, and I wanted to ask your uh, take on the Save America's Treasure and, and be able to continue uh, that funding and that program. Yeah, well, thank you for that question. And again, um, thank you. I'm very excited to be the committee chair and um, and, and to follow uh, Congresswoman McCollum. Those are big shoes to fill. She did a great job. And I feel like I'm still on a steep learning curve. Um, uh, it takes a long time to get up to speed on all the areas of the budget that um, you may not have known the details about when you weren't the chair. So I I'm learning quickly, but Save America's Treasures, um, I think, is, is very, very important. And I, I consider it critical to be part of our future funding package. And again, um, we haven't seen the president's budget. We won't see it for a while because of the new administration. Um, but between the budget and also um, thinking about some infrastructure spending and, and where that belongs, um, I think we will wanna continue, continue that program and, and certainly 
um, continue the funding. Great. And then we have a number of uh, advocacy scholars that are students, young professionals that are participating this week. And we have uh, one of our scholars, uh, Kristen Thomas, uh, is teed up to ask you a question. Is Kristen available? I see her. Good evening. Great. Congress has a huge challenge ahead to find funding sources to support economic recovery, infrastructure, climate change, affordable housing, diversity, and equity. How does historic preservation fit in? Well, I think given the, um, the many years of bipartisan support, um, this would be the wrong time to pull back on historic preservation. Um, as you mentioned, we have a lot on our plate right now, but for many of the um, things that you brought up, revitalizing our economy, putting people back to work, um, you know, many of the historic sites are also employers. They're also um, attractions for tourists. They're also revitalize a local economy. So I think there are good arguments um, as well as preserving our history. And as we think about equity and equality, um, it's also important to preserve those sites that remind us of our past, good and bad. And uh, I'm committed to doing that and making sure that we continue to um, consider including underserved areas, rural communities, um, just, just all of our history. Um, some of it that's easy to see in other parts that aren't so easy. One of the questions that is a good, a good problem to have uh, we've had because of your support and uh, Congresswoman McCollum and the many great advocates over the last several years, there's been a, a gradual increase uh, to the Historic Preservation Fund as we've gotten closer and closer to the authorized cap of 150 million. Um, and uh, Congressman Blumenauer mentioned earlier when he spoke that his letter is gonna be requesting full funding at 150 million for the first time. Uh, so that's a, a great milestone to be able to even make that ask. But it's been many years in the coming. Uh, the, the program's not up for reauthorization until 2023. And uh, if we get to the point where we hit that cap, a lot of us are thinking strategically, you know, what are some of the, the best ways to address raising that cap? But it's, a, it's a, not a conversation really for this year, but one for certainly years to come. Uh, and just wanted to let you know that's part of the conversation, but also uh, get your thoughts on kind of strategically how to address that uh, in the next few years. Uh, no, I mean, I think it's a good idea. And as you said, it's, it's a good problem to have that the funding has been increasing. And I think that um, continually shows people the effectiveness of the funding um, and the opportunities that it provides. I'm, I'm thrilled to hear that um, Congressman Blumenauer is suggesting that he wants to um, get behind that because he's a enthusiastic and hardworking member. And so it's good to have him on the team. Um, you know, like as with most um, funding, particularly funds that are dispersed across the country and, and um, serve uh, such a big variety of um, communities, the, the most important thing that happens is uh, bringing those examples to the members of Congress, um, often who don't know that um, this, this grant may have been instrumental in preserving a historic site um, and also um, the economic impact of it. I think, you know, in this era in particular, in the next couple of years, as we're thinking about, um, you know, just how to make sure people are working, how to make sure that communities um, are ha having the vitality that they need. It, it's a good time to make sure everyone is well informed about the funding and, and the good that it has been able to do. Yeah, well, our advocates are doing that throughout this week. And uh, I wanted to uh, ask my uh, co-host here, uh, Dr. Allison Books from the state of Washington uh, to see if she had any questions. Um, I don't have any questions, but I just wanted to thank um, Madam Chair for her comments on women's history, especially since I've been a member of the League of Women Voters for over a decade now. And I just love being part of the League. So thank you, recognizing the importance of women's history and 
and um, acknowledging women's sites. We've been working hard in Washington state to acknowledge Latino heritage in our state, which is not commonly thought of in Washington state, but yet we have a very robust Latino history. We are now working on Filipino history, Filipino American history, and of course, all our work with the tribes. So I really appreciate your comments on women's history, plus all, hopefully, um, we can expand the underrepresented communities grants that are part of interior because that's where we've managed to have the funding to really bring other groups that are not part of historic preservation into what we do and acknowledge their incredible um how much they've affected and affected american history and been a part of our history so we can be more inclusive so thank you for everything you do and i don't really have a question i just wanted to thank you well thank you and, and thank you for mentioning that i think um, again, as our country is looking inward and, um, you know, some of the equity issues that came up over the last summer um, really have forced us to, to rethink a lot of our history. And, um, and one of the great privileges of being um, on this committee is, is dealing with the tribes. And so making sure that that's an important part of our heritage is essential as well. So we'll certainly be looking at that. And I got the tail end of hearing about um, the barn project in your state. And as a small farmer myself and a New Englander, um, there's nothing better than looking at barns. And I'm sure you have some beautiful ones out there. Well, that's great. Uh, thank you. Thank you so much. That'd be great to have a, yes. Your leadership uh, in the Congress, uh, in the committee, uh, thank you for working with uh, our historic preservation advocates and the, the network that we have around the country. And we look forward to working with you in the, the months ahead. Great. Well, thanks so much for including me. Appreciate all the hard work uh, that everyone is doing. And, and I look forward to our continuing partnership. So nice to see you. Great to see you. Take care. Well, and good luck. All right, um, this concludes our program and just a special thanks to uh, Allison Brooks for uh, being uh, co-hosting with me. Uh, thanks for everybody who helped set this up and all of you for joining. Uh, special thanks to the members of Congress that joined us. Uh, I think you really see a, a passion there and how much they appreciate uh, the advocacy and the expertise that that uh, preservation leaders bring to this that really helps them do their job better uh, and make a difference. So thank you all so much. Thanks for being part of Preservation Week and uh, for all the visits you've done this week. We look, we've heard about many, uh, but we look forward to hearing about more and uh, working on those follow-ups and going forward. Thank you all so much. Have a great evening.